Good morning. morning. Welcome to Rossville Valley Community Church. We're glad to have you here this morning on this beautiful, beautiful fall Sunday morning. I guess it's officially fall now, right? Officially fall. Um, Nothing too dramatic in the way of announcements other than, uh, as John announced last Sunday, we will have a brief congregational meeting uh, immediately following the service, and that is just to officially... um, do the business of dissolving the the pastoral uh, responsibility of Josh. So uh, if you are a member, just just hang around. Uh, Are there any other announcements that need to come? Madeline. Six thirty Tuesday night, women of the church planning meeting. Jesse. <laughs> Good. John? Okay. Good, good. That's what it's about. Well, if there's no more announcements, let's prepare our hearts to worship our risen Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks this morning, Lord, that you've brought us here, that you've given us this privilege that we may come before you, come before your throne, and God, that we may come here and worship you. Lord, we are here for one purpose, and that is to glorify you, to glorify your name, to hear your word, and to give you praise. Father, we pray that our worship this morning will be pleasing unto you, and that you will bless every second of this time we have together, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you will, please stand and let's be called to worship. This will be a call and response. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. For his steadfast love endures forever. It is he who remembered us in our low estate. For his steadfast love endures forever. And rescued us from our foes. For his steadfast love endures forever. He who gives food to all flesh. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. For his steadfast love endures forever. Please remain standing and we'll sing our first hymn, How Great Thou Art.
Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we do each week, we come to a time where we face the fact that we are imperfect creatures. We all mean well and we all aim well, but we don't always hit the mark. And basically that's, that's what sin's about, is missing the mark. And we come together as a, as a body and as individual followers and bring our sins before our Lord confess them, and ask for his forgiveness this morning. So if you will, uh, join me in this time of silent confession, and then we'll pray together a prayer up on the screen. Let us pray. Let us pray together. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open us to a future in which we can be changed, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image, through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Loved ones, God is faithful, and in his word he says, if you bring your sins and confess them before me, I will forgive them. Hallelujah, our sins are forgiven. Amen. We'll transition now into a time of, of prayer, uh, what we call the prayers of the people. And uh, we bring before God our cares, our petitions, and our praises. So let us go to God in prayer now. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you bring us here and that your ear is always open to us. Lord, you invite us to come and pray to bring our very selves before you. And Father, you invite us to, to carry with us all the baggage that we have, all the things that, that concern us and, and may, cause us, may cause us grief, may cause us stress. And Father, we also bring before you, Lord, the things that bring us joy, that we know are gifts from you. Father, we thank you for this opportunity now to pray openly as a body and to bring our prayers to you. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, we do lift up Carol. Lord, we pray for strength 
We pray for mobility. We pray, God, that you would just bless her life and, and fill her with the strength that she needs to be able to transfer herself and come home and live as, as she would prefer. And God, we pray for Aaron, Lord, that you would just lift his heart, give him encouragement, and fill him, Lord, with, with, with excitement and fill him with your spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we do give you thanks for Cameron and Callan. Uh, many of us have watched them grow up here in this church and, and uh, see what, what great young ladies that, that they have become. We, we give you thanks for their 14 years on this earth, and we pray for many, many more happy years. Lord, in your mercy. Well, we do lift up Susan. God, she's a she's such a uh, important member of our family here, Lord, and and we do miss having her. And we thank you, Lord, that her surgery went well, and we pray for a recovery to go just as well. God, we just pray that you you just uh, mystify the doctors with her progress and recovery. And we pray for her dad, James, that you would just give him the support and the uh, the fellowship, Lord, that he needs as he. He lives alone there without her in there with him. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we give you thanks that you have uh, uh, brought those, those fires out in the northwest uh, somewhat under control. You did send them some rain, which they so desperately needed, and uh, it's good to he get some good reports from up there this week. We do continue to pray for the for the folks who've been devastated in the in the Gulf, Lord. They've uh, gone through lots of loss from the from the hurricanes. We just pray that you give them strength and and resources, Lord, that they need to rebuild. God, we pray that you be with this nation uh, during this turbulent time, and uh, God, let us not to be, not, let us not get sidetracked by what we see on the news and and what we what we hear on the radio, Lord, just let us keep our focus on you and to live our lives in the way that you want us to live. Father, we pray for our, our rescue workers, the ones who are out there every day uh, risking their lives for us, for our armed forces, Lord, for our, 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 uh, our leaders. God, we pray that you would just speak to them, that they would lead according to your will and, and depend on your voice to, to guide them. Father, now we, we come before you and, and we ask you to hear us as we pray together as Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, it's my great honor again uh, this Sunday to welcome Reverend Ron Horgan back. Uh, you'll be relieved to know I don't preach this week, so uh, <laughs> glad to have Ron back, back up, and he's going to continue us in our, in our series on Jonah. Thank you. Well, it's, it's good to be back, and it doesn't look like Jim lost anybody, and that's always a good thing. It's always a good thing. 
The only thing more dangerous than a, a ruling elder preaching in the church is when the youth director preaches. <laughs> and you're away from town, and uh, you just sit and wait and hope the phone doesn't ring. <laughs> Which it usually does. And it's never really great. But glad to, glad to have benefited from Jim's, Jim's preaching, God's word to you. Uh, and then the, the, this morning, as he said, we're, we're back in Jonah. I want to want to start by by asking you what what is the most most important gift that you could ever give someone. Now I know some of you might think of this. Well, a million dollars. Well, if you have it, think this way, or, or a trip around the world, or something like that. I, you know, we we think of some gifts as being really great, but I want to suggest to you this morning that uh, being a theologian theologian, but a, a pastor, you know I'm going to give you some kind of a spiritual answer to that question. Here it is. I, I think the most important gift we can give anyone is, is the gift of forgiveness, the, the gift of true forgiveness. Now, what I mean by, by true forgiveness is true forgiveness says that I won't ever hold against you anything you've ever done to me, ever. Ever. I won't ever speak of what you did against me ever again. I'll, I'll treat you just as if you had never said those terrible things about me that you said. I won't remember them ever. And friends, that's, there's incredible power released in our lives when we forgive. And it's especially powerful when we forgive someone who didn't even ask for it in the first place. You know, too often, I think, we forgive and forget, but then we forget that we forgot, right? And too often, we, we bury the hatchet, but we leave the handle sticking up just in case we might need it again. You know, forgiveness, forgiveness and forgetting is really hard, but but I know in my own life, and maybe you know in yours, that it's, it's really liberating. And that's probably because when we forgive and forget, it's a picture of what God has done for you and for me. Remember the words of the Apostle Paul. He said, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Why? Because just as in Christ Jesus, God forgave you. And that's why it's so powerful. It's, it's doing for others what, what God has done for us. And we see this, this power of forgiveness really prominently displayed in the life of Jonah. When we last left Jonah two weeks ago, he was in the belly of the great fish. And at that point, God really has three options for how he'll treat Jonah. Okay, he can, he can be God. He can forgive but then he can let nature take its course. Think about that, but not for too long. Second thing he can do is he can say, he can forgive Jonah and say, Jonah, I, I forgive you. I'm going to put you back out on dry land, but your license to be a prophet is hereby revoked. You can never be a prophet, but just, just leave me alone, but you can go on about your business. You can live, live life. Or then there's, there's this third option. And had God done either of those two, he would have been merciful. But God is even more merciful and more gracious than that. Because what we'll see in, in uh, chapter 3 today is, is that God delivers Jonah and he returns him into action. In fact, he sends Jonah out to complete the mission that God had originally called him to. God chooses to forgive Jonah and to give him new life. And so Jonah's response to this incredible, incredible act of forgiveness on God's part is, is to repent. Is to repent. Rather than continuing to run away from God, Jonah now turns and runs toward God. That's what repentance is all about. And the result, the result of Jonah's act of repentance 
is what has probably been the, the greatest evangelistic crusade in all of history. We'll get to that in a minute. But, but friends, as, as we get to the scripture and we dig down into this text, I wanna, wanted to say to you that whatever your sin, God, God wants to forgive you. God has no desire to, to leave you on the sidelines. See, a, a, as, long, as long as you're on this planet, as long as you are breathing this air that we breathe, God has a mission for you. It doesn't matter your age or your sex or your health or anything else. God has a mission for you. Whether, whether you're here with us physically present in church today or you're, you're out in, in a remote location watching on Facebook or FaceTime or whatever face we, you're having to look at this morning, God has a plan. God has a mission for you. And so I invite you to turn with me in your Bible to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis there. Just checking. Sure I was. Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. Uh, actually, I'm going to back up and get us out of the way of uh, the belly of the fish and, and begin in chapter 2 verse 10. But this is God's word. Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out on the dry land. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh, shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. That's, that's a key phrase there. The people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth. From the greatness, they called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word of the Lord reached the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through, through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. And when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So what, what, what is the power that's unleashed in Jonah's life when God forgives him? Well, I think first we see that God's forgiveness, God's forgiveness of Jonah brings about Jonah's repentance and his restoration. Now remember, God, God makes the first move. This isn't Jonah's idea. He didn't come up with it. But God forgives. And then Jonah responds. Jonah responds in an act of repentance. Thomas, Thomas Manton, an old 17th century Puritan preacher who was the, the clerk of the uh, Westminster meeting and also the, the chaplain to Oliver Cromwell, he said, he said this about the power of God's forgiveness. He said, forgiveness invites us to return to God. Forgiveness obliges us to return to God. Forgiveness inclines us to return to God and forgiveness encourages us to live in a state of holy friendship with God, pleasing him and serving him in righteousness all our days. I love that phrase. That forgiveness encourages us to live in a, in a state of holy friendship. Holy friendship with God. 
But can you imagine anything better? I mean, Jonah certainly didn't deserve to have holy friendship. You and I don't deserve to be holy friends of God. If God forgive us, it, 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 would, be, it would be gracious if he would just forgive us and send us out as his slaves. Or, or if he forgives us and makes us his employees. Or, or forgives us and just doesn't mess with us because life is messy. But God forgives us. He forgives us. And we become his friends. Imagine, friends of God. You and I are friends of God. See, God, God forgives and he restores. He restores Jonah to active duty, to ministry. And Jonah's response then is to repent and to be obedient to God. And God really wants to do the same thing for you and me. Have you been in a time of time out? I and mean, we all feel like we're still in time out, don't we? And some of us are in time out because of our sin. And in a quiet moment with nobody but God listening, we might even be willing to admit that. Some of us feel like we're in time out through no fault of our own, not really because of our sins, although we, we all still sin, but, but we feel in time out. Well, whatever your circumstance, if you feel like you're in time out because of sin, repent. Confess to God. Say to God, God, I know I really messed that up. I really messed that up and a few other things too. God, forgive me. I Cleanse me. As we prayed in our prayer of confession today, when we, when we confess, God does this incredible thing of forgiving us. You know, there, there's no court in the land where you can confess your sin and it's a good thing. You confess and judgment immediately falls on you. But when we confess to God, the incredible thing that happens is he forgives us. And God wants to do the same for you and me. So ask him to restore you, to put you back in service. And then look for ways that God might use you to be Jesus to someone in need. So we see that the forgiveness of God brings about Jonah's repentance. And then we see after that that Jonah's repentance brings about the redemption of Nineveh. Back to our story, this, this is probably the greatest evangelistic crusade this world has ever seen. Remember, Nineveh is a town of somewhere between 600,000 and a million people. And what scripture tells us is that this 600,000 to a million people experienced conversion. They experienced mass conversion, all because God was faith, uh, because Jonah was faithful to take the message to the people. And the message was not a pretty one. The message was, hey guys, come and be cool for us, cool with Jesus. Be cool like us with Jesus. The message was pretty stark. 40 days and Nineveh will be overturned. Your Bible may say or Nineveh will be destroyed. What part of that is unclear? But you see, the people heard the message and the people of Nineveh, just like Jonah, repented. And it wasn't just the poor, the down and outers that wanted, that wanted a way out of this mess. It was, it was the king, the head man, and the nobles. They got into it. They all repented. Figure out, this, this is really a miraculous event. I mean, Jonah, Jonah had to be shocked. As we'll see next week, he wasn't that happy either, which is a whole other story, but I digress. Jonah was shocked that there's no human reason to believe that God would do anything in the hearts of the people of Nineveh. Remember, Nineveh was an invincible city. It, it had this great big wall, three chariots wide surrounding it with, with guard towers and everything. It was impenetrable. Nineveh had a, had a really fierce army. We talked about that in the first chapter. No one, no one could take them down. They had it all. And yet, for some reason, their hearts were broken. And they repented. They followed God. 
Now, were they, were they really saved? Was, was their conversion really genuine? Well, if Jesus is any authority, yes. I mean, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, he says, uh, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You see, Jonah is a picture of what's going to happen with the Lord Jesus. But now here we go. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. Why? For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And someone greater than Jonah is here. Why, why would Jesus say that the people of Nineveh repented? Why would he say they were saved, they were born again? Well, because we see in their lives the evidence of true conversion. A true conversion really re involves three, three aspects of our life. First, it involves, it involves the head. It involves having right information. Uh, they had to have the right content here. And the content here is really simple. Forty days and Nineveh will be destroyed. So we, first we have to have the right information. We don't just become followers of Jesus because we have feelings or things, a mystery and all that sort of thing. But they had the right information. Second, it involved conversion not only of the head but of the heart. They, they believed it to be true. They believed this message to be true. Verse 5, the people believed God. Now, this, as I said, required really a supernatural change of their heart. Nevertheless, they heard the right information. And they believed it to be true. But then here's the kicker. Here's, here's where the real money is made. That's probably a crass way of saying it. But here's how we know they were actually converted is, is because they acted on their belief. They had head knowledge. They had heart knowledge. And it worked its way out in their hands. They changed their position based on the information they had received. They declared a fast. They put on sackcloth and sat in ashes. They, they demonstrated contrition. They lamented their, their own spiritual condition. And no one less than the king calls, calls out to the people to repent, to be contrite, to call out to the one true God, hoping perhaps that this new faith would lead God to forgive their sins and not destroy them. See, these are, these are the, the three key elements of, of saving faith or of biblical regeneration or however you choose to understand it. Oh, we, we have the right stuff in our head. Our hearts are changed. But it's not just that our, our hearts get warm and we believe and we believe and we believe. No, See, we, we, have to, we have to change our action. We have to rely on the truth and act on it. That's why James says to the, the church, he says, you believe there's one God? You have it in your heart. You believe? Well, good. Or as the Horgan translation would say, well, big hairy deal. Even the demons believe that. And they shudder. They believe that they shudder. You see, we have to act on we have to act on what we know to be true. In in the 1850s, there was a, a great acrobat, a tightrope walker named the Great Blondin, and uh, he came over from from England to America, and he would perform these great feats of walking a tightrope. Well, one one day he he stretched a tightrope across Niagara Falls. Now I don't know if you've ever been across Niagara Falls. Or been there, but it's it's impressive. Well, it, this great Blondin stretches out this tightrope across Niagara Falls, and he walks across it back and forth a few times, and everybody cheers and is impressed. And the next day, he shows up, and he's got a wheelbarrow, and and he puts this wheelbarrow on top of the tightrope, and he says, "I'm going to walk across Niagara Falls with this wheelbarrow on a tightrope." Oh, everybody cheers, and he says, "And you know what? I'm going to walk across this." tightrope, and, and I'm going to put somebody in the wheelbarrow and take them across 
with me. Everybody cheered, said, Every, anybody believe I can do that? Yeah, go, 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 go. He looked at the crowd, he said, okay, who wants to get in the bucket? Whoa, yeah. Now don't ask me if the, the person, anyone was brave enough to get into the bucket, but that's, that's what faith is all about. It's one thing to say, oh, we know you can do it. We believe in you. Okay, who's going to join me? And that's what Jesus asks of us. Uh, do you believe? Do you truly believe? Or do you just have this really warm feeling about faith? See, too many of us know the right stuff, and we believe it to some extent, but we haven't really changed our position. We, we, we're... And, and if that's the case, friends, I got to tell you, you're, you're as lost as a person who's never heard of Jesus, who's out there, doesn't know anything. Why? Because faith is about action. And I want to ask you this other question. Is, is there someone in your life who you know and you think, yeah, he'll never come to faith in Jesus. This guy, yep. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. Just scratch him off the list. Well, how do you know? How do you know? I mean, what if, what if you were to find a way to have a spiritual conversation and somehow that person miraculously came to faith? Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that make you feel like, you know, life was worth living? You see, Jonah repented and Nineveh repented. And 600,000 to a million people expressed their faith in the one living and true God. Jonah repented. The people of Nineveh repented. But what about, what about God? Did, did God repent? Sounds kind of like it. Sounds like God changed his mind. That's a kind of a scary thought, isn't it? Because we believe that God knows everything. He's all-powerful. and He changed his mind. Well, I want to suggest to you that, that we, we, don't, we don't have the words to describe adequately what, what goes on in God's mind. But I think what we see here is God didn't change his mind. God knew what he was going to do. That God was being true to his word and to himself. See, God's warning and, uh, and God's proclamation of Potential judgment always carries with it, always carries with it, either the spoken or the implied understanding that, that the call for repentance, if heeded, bears fruit. If, if the bearer hears the message and changes his or her ways, God will act based on this new behavior. Now, does God, is God all of a sudden convinced and, some, and needs to change his own mind? No. God knows what he's going to do. But we read, for instance, God speaking to the people of God through, uh, through the prophet Jeremiah. God says this, Jeremiah chapter 18. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil... I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do it. Now, here's the flip side of that. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant, if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I intended to do to it. Hear that? God, God is not willing for people to perish. But he's also not standing in the way of those who shake their fist and say, no, I'm not in on this. I don't understand how this free, free, free will and sovereignty thing works. I don't. All I know is it's our responsibility to call people to come to faith and then see what God will do. See, what changed was not God. What changed was the people's heart. And when the hearts of the people change toward God, his heart, or we could say maybe his attitude, his relationship with them changed. Nineveh, Nineveh changed for the better. 
God, in, in his meticulous sovereignty, his meticulous providence, knew that he would do it. God's attitude toward evil did not change, but his attitude toward the people changed consistent with their turning toward him. And God, God warns us for the purpose of calling us to change. And it's, it's the same way we warn our kids to change their ways lest they suffer some consequence. It's the same way in the law. When we break the law, we're subject to being uh, treated properly but punitively. At the same time, when we're obedient, we're, we stand right before the law. And so, so again, as I close, we, we come back to the gospel. We come back to the gospel. J uh, Jonah went to Nineveh with the message of the need for repentance. The funny thing is he never expected it to happen. And so, as I close, I want to ask you, is there, is there a Ninevite? Is there a, a Nineveh person in your life? If I were to ask you to get out a sheet of paper, or if we were to stand and just have a time of sharing, who in your life, never come to faith, never going to happen? I, we probably all have one or two or a hundred names on that list. But maybe, maybe you could at least start to pray for that person. Maybe you could just start praying for that person. And who knows, maybe God would open a door for you to have a faith conversation. Maybe God would use you. This, and this person who is every bit as unlikely to come to faith is the people of Nineveh. God would, God would open their eyes. God would work the miracle of regeneration in their head, their heart, and their hands. And they believe. How great would that be? You know, I, I want to see this church succeed. I want to see this church grow. Not because we just need numbers, but because we want to see people who today walk in darkness come into the light of Christ. People who are far from God, would come in. I mean, you can go get a bunch of Baptists and other Presbyterians and Methodists and that and bring them in, and yeah, it's, that's just like fish jumping from this bowl to the next bowl. And that, that's okay. I, I'm, as a pastor, I'm not against anybody wanting to come to a really good church. But, but it's so much, so much better, so much cooler when God takes somebody who's walked in darkness, who's been far from God, and comes to faith, and you get to be there when it's happening, when it's happening. So, so friends, I want you to be, ask you to just begin praying that God would, God would put someone in your path. Maybe he already has, and maybe you already know who it is. Just put someone in your path. Just talk a little bit. Just put your toes in the water. Put your spiritual toes in the water. See if God might be starting a relationship that over time, over time, the person would come to faith. One of the one of the greatest uh, ways uh, that a pastor talked about growing his church was was this. He said, "Each one, reach one. Each one, reach one. Who in your life needs Jesus? You see, God has forgiven us. He's forgiven us, and we've repented of our sins. And if we really, truly want to follow Jesus, then what has happened in our heart?" Our head, what's happened in our heart, and then what's happening in our hands will we'll, we'll produce fruit, and we'll see the kingdom of God grow. That's how, that's how this church will grow. That's how our faith will grow, for God's glory and for our good. Let's pray. Father, we <laughs> stand amazed at uh, the result of the mass conversion of the people of Nineveh, people as hardened, hardened against you as anybody who ever existed, and yet in your mercy, in your mercy, you heard their prayers, and you gave the gift of new life to them. God, that's what we want for each of us here. That's what we want for those of us who are, are attending virtually, 
Facebook or FaceTime or whatever. God, we we want to we want to believe not just with our head, not just with our heart, but we want to go out and be used by you. Would you do that in our lives? Thank you. Thank you for the fact that we don't go alone, but we go with you. And thank you for the brothers and sisters we can walk along with together. God, we we are at your service. Use us for your glory, we pray through Christ. Amen. Well, if you will, please stand. And we'll sing our closing hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Amen. In all the years that have passed since the time of Jonah till now, God hasn't changed. He still sends us to call the lost to him. We can, we can guarantee that. So go today, empowered by God, share the peace and love of Christ through service, worship, and discipleship. Amen.